you are so, so good. We have so many reasons to give you praise and to give you thanks. Lord, you've been faithful in our past, and we can truly trust you to be faithful in our future, no matter what we're going through this morning, no matter what battles we're fighting. Uh, But God, sometimes it can be just so hard to trust you. It can be so hard to believe that you really will come through, that you really will take care of us the way your word says. And so I'm just going to pray, God, right now you would give us faith as your people, as your church. Just give us the faith that we require, even if it's just for today or this week, but just a fresh filling, Lord. And just be here with us this morning, just more of you, more of you in our hearts, more of you in our minds, even our bodies. I would ask you for that. Meet us where we're at, and we're going to pray this and lift this up to you in in your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Adam Brook. (laughs) Thank you for making it to church on this cold Minnesota winter morning. Way to go. (laughs) You got here. Um... I, I do want to just say, if you're a first-time guest with, with us, we're so glad you're here. Uh, just sit back, relax. We hope you can just enjoy the rest of the service. If you're watching online, thank you for being a part of, of what's going on here at Edinburgh as well. I'm super excited as your pastor for our partnership with Treehouse. Thank you for being here this morning. So glad we get to partner up. As many people here at Edinburgh Church know, I was an at-risk youth. I would have been very blessed by a ministry like this. So I'm excited that you're going to have your office here, that you're going to be meeting on Tuesdays and Thursdays here, that we're going to kind of be a base uh, for Treehouse here in the Brooklyn Park in northern Minneapolis um, area. So excited. We're in our uh, series, Experiencing the Goodness of God, and our hope for you in this series is that we would have more and more faith to trust in the goodness of God, especially in light of the battles and the troubles and the struggles we have in this, in this world. This is based on something the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 when he says, we often suffer, but we are never crushed. He says, even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us, and when we are knocked down, we get up again. How great it would be for each and every one of us and for our families if no matter what hit us in life, we were able to get up trusting in the goodness of God. Paul goes on in chapter 6 to say, in everything we do, We show that we are the true ministers of God. We are the people of God. We patiently endure, listen to this, troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. You know, we would love to avoid troubles and struggles in life, but the Bible is clear. You and I are going to face troubles and struggles of every kind here in this world, whether it be in our family, relationship, issues, uh, marriage, challenges, whether it be raising our kids, uh, challenges at work, and even challenges in our finances. Paul says in verse 7 of chapter 4, though, we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. So as believers, what the Apostle Paul is telling us is we have a power that unbelievers don't have to overcome the troubles and struggles and challenges of this world. And I know some of you this morning, you're you're not a believer yet, and our greatest hope for you is that you would make that decision so that you could have this power in you to help you overcome the struggles and the challenges that this world brings. And so I just want to ask you the question, what is your struggle this morning? What's that trouble in your life? I think many of us, if we were honest, we would say it's our finances. I hear that a lot. I'm struggling with my finances. I'm in debt up to my ears. Um, I need need help in my finances. I was just reading uh, an article that over 60% of Americans say they struggle with anxiety because of their finances. And, And so my second question for you is, though, what if you could overcome that trouble in your life? Who wouldn't want that? 
Look at what the Apostle Paul says in chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians. In, in, in 2 Corinthians, this, this book we're working through in this series, you know, he's going to spend two full chapters, chapters 8 and 9, dealing with this topic of our finances, helping us to experience the goodness of God in our finances. In verse 6 of chapter 9, he says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not out of regret or compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. I love this word, abound to you, so that in all things, listen to this, at all times, having all that you need, you will, again, he says it, abound in every good work. I found myself thinking about that word, to, to abound. It literally means to have abundance, to, to, to be full, to have the fullness of God's blessing in our life. A few weeks back, Danielle and I um, had some time off, and we were debating what we should do. Uh, we had thrown out the idea, what if we just took a road trip with our kids, went up to, to Duluth and did some tubing, at Spirit Mountain, and we liked that idea, but, but we were also struggling with just staying home and just watching TV, right? The easier thing to do. And so we were beginning to waffle. Let's just stay home. Let's just, you know, hang out here and stay low. But uh, Danielle was like, no, let's do this. And so we got in the car, we loaded up the kids, and we made a road trip all the way up to Duluth, at where we, we hit up Spirit Mountain and we, we did some tubing. We get to the top of this hill, just, a, just an awesome time with the kids. I mean, just beautiful scenery over Lake Superior as we're at the top of this hill. At one point, uh, we didn't even want to wait for the conveyor belt to take us to the top. So we're like, we're just going to hike the hill. So I grabbed Callie. You know, she's on her tube, and I just pulled her up to the top. We beat everybody in line. And then as a family, we raced down the hill. It was a lot of work. And it wasn't cheap. I don't know if those tubes are made out of gold or what, but it's, it's not cheap. But you know what? Friends, we were abounding. We were abounding. From there, we said, let's go over to your parents' place who live up north. We spent the night over there. And then the next morning, we again had this decision to make. Did we want to just sit at home and just kind of watch TV and veg? Or did we want to go snowshoeing? So again, we were waffling because we didn't want to get out into the cold, but Daniel's dad was like, no, let's do it. And so we put on our snowshoes and we went outside and we started hiking over these hills and over these farms. We went into this white covered forest. We're snowshoeing along this 30 foot tall cliff that leads down to this lake. We go out on the lake. Friends, we had it all to ourselves because nobody else wanted to be outside in this. It was absolutely wonderful. It was beautiful. We six miles of snowshoeing. We come home, it's dark, we eat something warm. And on the way home, Danielle said, I'm so glad we didn't sit at home. I'm glad we did this. Because friends, we were abounding. We were abounding. Now I know for some of us, we say, that's good for you, pastor. <laughs> I've got three kids at home with a mountain of laundry, how am I supposed to abound? Just this, well, it was probably two weeks ago now, I was walking out into the parking lot, and I see this mother trying to cram her three kids into the SUV. And as I got closer, I realized it was my family, so I hid. <laughs> because she was not winning this battle. No, I, I went and I helped, but I wanted to hide. I get it. It's not always easy to abound. It's not always easy. There's, there's sacrifice involved. Now, I just want to say, if you are that stay-at-home mom with those three kids, you've got to find ways to abound. Whether it's getting up in the morning, whether it's staying up late and having some time to yourself, whether it's paying a babysitter, which is a sacrifice so that you and your spouse can go on a date and just bound in your relationship with one another. You've you got to find ways to do it, but it doesn't come without sacrifice. In fact, here's a true statement for you. We won't abound without sacrifice and without sometimes just having to grind it out. Isn't that true? Sometimes in life, you just have to grind it out. You just have to survive. There is a sacrifice that comes with abounding. But this is what 
God wants us to do. You know, I grew up with a scarcity mindset, and I bet some of you out there this morning kind of have this scarcity mindset when it comes to what you think God wants for your life. The reason I had the scarcity mindset was because I grew up poor. I mean, my family just, we did not have a lot of money. Money was always an issue growing up in my household. It did not get easier. When Danielle and I got married, uh, we were very poor. We were both trying to graduate college, trying to stay out of as much debt as possible. Um, you know, so we're working part-time, living in this tiny, tiny apartment, just trying to make ends meet. And it caused me to have this scarcity mindset. You know, I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but I would buy clothes sometimes, like a shirt, and I would bring it home and almost feel guilty that I'd bought it because it was so expensive, even though I needed it, and it would just hang there in my closet. I wouldn't even wear it. So afraid I would ruin it. I kept thinking, oh, I'm going to wear it in the future at some point, you know, on a special occasion. And this shirt would just hang there. And Danielle would be like, what are you doing? Wear the shirt. <laughs> it's going to go out of style by the time you, you choose to wear it. In fact, there's some shirts that I've kept so long, they have come back in style <laughs> that I have never worn. I've worn some up, up, in, up here on stage. And I don't know what that was in me, but it was this scarcity mindset. Like I was got to have to hold on to everything and I was even scared to use what I had. But then I started seeing that in other people, people older than me, people I actually cared about, people in my family. And then you know what happened? They died. They died with their shirts still hanging in their closet and that money still sitting in their 401k that they never used because of that scarcity mindset. And fortunately, God put some godly men and women in my life who taught me that God wants us to abound. He wants us to abound. And my question for you this morning is, what if you could abound? What if you could abound in your finances? This morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk us through just a few of the principles that the Apostle Paul teaches us in, in this chapter 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians. And I'm just going to tell you right out of the gate this is going to be very counterintuitive, these lessons that the Apostle Paul is going to teach. You're not going to hear these things on TV. Some of you are going to look at me like I have, you know, a third head, okay? Um, these are things that are very counterintuitive of life, but I want you to hear this. These principles are from God, and these principles work. And so if you have a handout, you can follow along. But here's the first one. I, I, I got to sow generously. If I'm going to abound... I've got to be generous. I've got to sow generously. The Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, remember this. This is in verse 6 of chapter 9. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now, this is a farming right, uh, illustration here that Paul is using. Every farmer knows that if you scatter lots of seed, you can expect a greater harvest. If you're stingy with your seed and you spare, you know, you're sparing with your seed, you can expect a small harvest. Apostle Paul is teaching us here that we've got to be willing to sow lots of seed. The idea here is that you, you get what you give. This is true, friends, in your relationship with God. You're going to get out of your relationship with God what you put into your relationship with God. The same is true in your finances. Proverbs 11.24 says it this way, One gives freely, is generous, yet grows all the richer, abounds. Another withholds what he should give. This is a person who's stingy, that has that scarcity mindset, holds on tightly, and he becomes poor. This is a principle that the Bible teaches. Friends, the, the, what we learn through the scriptures is that when we're willing to trust God in the area of our finances, and that's really what it comes down to, your problem is not a money issue. It's a faith issue. Who are you going to trust? And the Bible teaches us when we're willing to trust God, especially in this area of our finances, an area where we tend to want to cling on for dear life, we experience something I would call the God factor. Okay, maybe you've heard of the X factor, right? A team might have the X factor, a player who helps bring an impact that leads to the greatest outcome. When you trust God in this area of your life, you have the God factor in your life. 
God is on your team. He, he can bring an impact into your life that can help you have the greatest outcome. I think for many of us who trust God in this area of our lives, we're going to get to heaven one day, and we're going to see all of the things that could have gone wrong in life, all the things that could have broken down and failed us. And we're going to see all the things that God spared us from. Now, now don't hear me saying things don't break down. Don't hear me think, saying things don't go out, because i just tell you right now, they're, they're going out here at Edinburgh Church, all over the place. But I also believe that when we have the God factor in our life, he provides and he protects us from what could be a lot worse. You know, just this last December, um, we had our three Christmas services. And I don't know about you, but that feels like that was eons ago now. <laughs> but one of the things the leadership team talked about and really wrestled with was taking an offering at our Christmas services. We decided we were not going to take an offering at our three Christmas services. And the reason for that was we just believed that people were going to be coming into church, some for the first time, and that we had this opportunity to tell them about Jesus. And we did not want anything, including money, to get in the way of people receiving the free gift of salvation. We didn't want people having any excuse why they couldn't receive God because we know what people think, that the church just wants their money, we didn't want anything getting in the way of the most important thing, which is people just having a relationship, a personal relationship with Christ. And I hope you know that's the heart of your leadership around here, because even though we wrestled with it, we said, no, it's worth it. People coming to know Jesus is worth it. Because you've got to understand, that's typically our greatest giving weekend of the year. December is our greatest giving month of the year. And we said, we're not going to do it. It's more important that people come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We'll trust God with our finances. But friends, we experienced the God factor because even though we, for the first time, did take an offering at our three Christmas services and made that sacrifice, did you know that December 2018 was Edinburgh's best giving month ever in our church history? Okay, that's the God factor, friends, that I'm talking about. We didn't expect that. We, weren't pl we were planning on taking a hit. You see, when God's on your team, you have the God factor. You don't just need, I'm not just talking about our money here. <laughs> Yes, God will bless your finances, but it's so much more than that. He'll bless you in better areas. He'll bless you in your relationships. He'll bless you just in your heart and your relationship with him. He'll give you things like love, joy, and peace. When you have the God factor in your life, he will bless you in your relationships. He'll bless you in your relationship with friends. He'll give you friends, make you rich in friendships. He'll bless you in your relationship with your spouse. Friends, we all have trouble in our marriage. I don't know about you. I need the God factor in my marriage because Danielle and I are not perfect people. I need the God factor in my parenting. Amen? And many of us feel like we fall short in that area of parenting, myself included. And I want you to know, we're a church that prays for you. We want to help you in that. Some of you, you don't feel like you need any help in your area of parenting. We especially pray for you, okay? <laughs> I need help in my parenting, and friends, I want to see my kids grow up, and I want to see my kids love Jesus, and wherever God's plan for their life is, and whatever the career he's going to have in place for them, I want to see them living out their faith wherever he puts them. That, friends, that's abounding, that's abounding. But we all know people who have lots of money and their lives are miserable. They're not abounding. And our kids grow up and, and, and don't know Jesus. Man, that's why this is the heartbeat of our church that we'd be able to point people to Christ and fight for family in such a way that it affects future generations so that we can abound. This is, this is what God wants for us. He wants us so generously. It starts by having that God factor in my life, which comes when I'm generous. The second principle, though, that Paul teaches us is that we need to sow whether we have a little or a lot. I need to be willing to sow whether I have a little or a lot. He says this about the church of Macedonia in chapter 8. He says, I, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. 
They, they didn't have a lot, but listen to this. But they also are filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. They were poor, but they gave with what they had. The reason many of us aren't generous is because, you know, we, we say things like, I, I don't have enough. But most of us, we have more than we realize. Most of us have excess. I mean, if you have cable TV, you have excess. If you have a smartphone, you have excess. You know, if you have three TVs in your home, that's excess. If you play video games, that's excess and a waste of time. But that's just me. If you have season tickets, you have excess. If you're able to take trips to Duluth, that's an absolute necessity. So let me just say that. But <laughs> no, you have excess paying for gas and whatnot to do those kinds of road trips. Friends, we all have more than we realize. The problem is we watch HGTV and we see these new homes that people, and we say, I don't have enough. Why don't I have that? And we lose our contentment. But the reality is most of us, most of us have excess. And, and God's saying with whatever you have, it's not the amount you give. You know, it, it, it's, just, it's your heart in the matter. And whether you have a little or a lot, are you sacrificing? Are you giving and trusting me? Um, Danielle and I, again, have experienced some literally poverty in our life, being under what would be considered the poverty level. Uh, I remember when we moved up to Minnesota, we lived over in the St. Paul side, had our first mortgage, which we were really excited about. But a couple years into that mortgage, uh, Danielle lost her job. And I was in the ministry at the time, but I was, I mean, I wasn't making much money. I was making $1,000 a month to do ministry. Danielle doesn't have her job anymore. We get a severance package, and we're trying to parcel that out. How many months can we pay our mortgage before we lose our house kind of thing? I'll never forget walking down the road with our kids, just my head kind of downcast, and Danielle grabbing my hand and telling me it's going to be okay. And just praying. But I, I, I'm telling you, friends, one of the things that we committed ourselves to, even in that time, is we just said we are going to, we're not going to stop giving. We've been giving 10%. We're going to, Lord, we're going to trust you. We believe it's hard right now, but that we will see your goodness again if we trust you in this area of our life. And so we continued to give. Our, her severance was starting to run out. Next thing I know, I get a phone call, a church saying, hey, we're looking for a lead pastor. That church was Edinburgh Church. I go through the interview process, Edinburgh decides they want to bring me on, you know, as, as your lead pastor. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I, it, was, it was amazing because I remember sitting down at the bank. We sold our house, but we needed to move closer. I'm not working. I hadn't started at Edinburgh Church yet. Danielle had been laid off. She has no job. And I'm never going to forget sitting across from the banker who said, let me get this right. So Brent, you, you haven't started yet. You're not working. I said, that's right. He said, Danielle, you don't have a job. That's right. Well, we'll go ahead and give you the loan anyways. And I got to tell you, this house that God provided for us, it just sat there on the market. Houses don't sit on the market like that in our neighborhood for the price this was going at. It was like, it might as well have had a neon sign that said, this house is for you guys. We believe that house was from God and God made it happen. That was the X factor. In fact, the month that our severance ran out, I received my first paycheck from Edinburgh Church. Friends, that's the X factor. We've been there, but I believe if you ask Danielle, it goes back to saying, God, we're going to trust you whether we have a little, well, we're going to trust you whether we have a lot. God's been good. I get to be your pastor. Friends, this is a great honor. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, I want to say to you, seriously, it's not me. I mean, the volunteers around here, your generosity around we hear stories of lives being transformed and changed every week. People coming, 40 people out of our Christmas services giving their life for the first time to Jesus Christ. This, I never, I never dreamed that this would be my life. God has been good. God has been faithful. I want to encourage you. So whether you have a little, whether you lie, it's, it's not a money issue. It's a who am I going to trust issue. But here's the third principle. 
I need to sow with a plan. I need to sow with a plan. If you just say, someday I'll start sowing. That was going to be the fourth point. I, 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 I. <laughs> Should be playing. All right. <laughs> See, our volunteers are great around here. So with a plan. A <laughs> plan. Oh, man. Look at what Paul says in verse 7 of chapter 9. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. It's a decision. You've got to be decisive because if you're just saying, you know, I'm going to wait till we have more, I'm telling you, or I'm going to give God my leftovers. If there's anything left over at the end of the month, then I'll give out of that. It's not going to happen, and it's going to be really hard to be faithful in this area of our lives. And so you need to have a plan, and I'm about to teach you a plan that Danielle and I have used, many of you have used. It's a plan we will teach our kids someday as well. Um, But it's a plan that has blessed many people. But look at what Paul says in verse 10. He says, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Friends, this is not about us. Okay, God doesn't bless us and give us a, a, a abundance so that we can keep it all for ourselves. It's so that we can be then a blessing to other people. Danielle and I believe firmly that God did not put it and provide that house for us so that we can just enjoy that house. We believe he put us in that house because we are surrounded by neighbors who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And God planted us there because he wants us to build relationships with them. We've even been able to invite some of them to church in the hopes that we can lead them into the greatest relationship they can have. It's not for us. We get to enjoy the home, but there's a bigger story that's being written here. Now, this plan I was telling you about, it's something we call the 10-10-80 plan. It's where you give 10% to God, it's where you save 10%, and you live off 80. This is called the 10-10-80 plan. So I give 10 I save 10, and I live off 80. Give, save, live. I know some of you right now, you hear that give 10%, and you say, Pastor, you are out of your mind. How could we ever give 10%? I know, it sounds crazy to me when I read that God wants us to give 10%. But someone just recently sent me this story, and I, and I want to share it with you. Because I, I, I want to ask you this question, what if the God factor is real? And what if you and your family could experience the God factor in your lives? I believe some of you want that this morning. Here's someone who experienced the God factor, wrote me this, said, growing up, I always remember my dad talking about the importance of tithing. He would say things like 10% was a simple gift if you remember that God has given us everything. Even though I grew up with a great example and generous parents, when it came time for the rubber to meet the road, I always struggled with giving. I thought things like, this is my money. I worked hard for this. What if I couldn't pay my bills? There were many times when we were first married that I would not tithe to make sure I paid our bills. We didn't make a lot of money. And in that season, we especially struggled I was anxious and constantly thinking about money. The most ironic part was I worked at a church. (laughs) I was supposed to know better. I'd even taught a lesson on it. As I grew in my relationship with Jesus, I started to take steps forward and increase our giving. We began budgeting and making it a priority. We still didn't make a lot of money and the bills kept coming. There was one time when uh, when it was the week where I typically wrote out our tithe check But we had student loans due that Monday. The temptation to not tie that week was there. But I knew that giving was an act of worship and God would be faithful in our sacrifice. We were $306 short on our bills. The very next day, we got a check in the mail for overpaying on our escrow. 
The escrow refund was a check for $326. I instantly knew that God was at work. To be honest, I didn't really know what an escrow was. (laughs) Heck, I still do not fully understand it. But I do know that God is faithful to care for us, even if we don't know how. It might not always be an escrow check in the mail. Most of the time, it's a peace and a joy. But God reminds me that I can give cheerfully because my focus is not on my kingdom here on earth, but on the kingdom of God. That individual who shared that with me, I just want to thank them. Just an incredible story of the God factor that we experience when we trust God in this area. That's very hard, our finances. And by the way, I put it in your handout. If, If you are interested, sign up for our financial peace class. Sign up for this class. It, it has changed many people's lives. They talk about the 10, 10, 80 plan. I'm promising you, yes, there's an investment in it, but there are scholarships available for you. And I just want to encourage you, you can find all the information you need online. Consider signing up for that. But as we close, friends, I'm going to give you a challenge. I want to give you a challenge this morning. I talked to our leadership about it, and they felt good about this. This is based on something we read in Malachi 3.10, where God says this. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. By the way, that word tithe literally means 10%. It means a tenth. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Listen to this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Test me in this. And see if I will not... Throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is the one and only time God says in his word, you can put me to the test. And so the leaders here at Edinburgh said, how can we help with this? Because we know this is a challenge and I feel like there's some out right now who want to take this challenge. And by the way, I'm going to encourage you to go home, talk about this with your spouse. I'm not asking any of you to do something your spouse would not be comfortable with. But the challenge is this. If you will give to Edinburgh Church, and I'm asking you to give a tenth. I know not all of you are there yet or ready for that, but at least could strive the best you can to give to Edinburgh Church for the next three months. If you don't experience the God factor, in your life, in some meaningful way, you can write us at that email I put at the bottom of your handout. That will go to the finance team and we will give you all your money back. That's what we want to do for you. We want to help you put God to the test. So as long as you mark it and you let us know it's from you, you write us and say, I didn't experience the God factor. We'll give you your money back. We are so confident you are going to experience God in this because he says in this, his word, you can put me to the test. We believe you're going to experience God in a meaningful, powerful way. And that's our hope ultimately for all of us is that we would abound, not just in our finances, but in every area of life. You going to take us up on that challenge? <laughs> Go home, talk about it, pray about it. Let's put God to the test together, friends. Let me pray for us. In fact, let's do this. Can we just stand up and I'll I'll pray if you're able. First off, God, uh, just thank you that you are a God who's with us and that The X factor is real. Danielle and I and many here at Edinburgh have experienced it over and over and over, and that's my heartbeat for all of us, is that we would have you a part of our lives, seeing you do things that we can't do in our own strength. You see things that we don't see. You are able to do miracles and do the impossible, and we can't. You're able to see into the future. We can't see into the future. So we need you in our lives, Lord. And I know there are some here right now who give faithfully. And I just want to pronounce a blessing over those who do give and trust you in that area. Because sometimes we give and we forget and we lose our joy even in it. We lose our cheerfulness in it. God, I just pray you to restore that to us because we're, that money is going to build your kingdom here on earth. And so may there be an extra special, I just pray blessing over those who are trusting you in this area of their life, may they experience you in rich ways and profound ways this week. God, I know there's some here, they're not giving the way you prescribe in your word, and they've had a hard time trusting you in this, in this area, but they want to. The desire is there. And so I'm just praying, give them helpful next steps. 
Give them the faith, because that's ultimately what this is, Lord, that they, they need to be able to trust you in this area of life. I'm just going to pray you do a supernatural work in our hearts to help us make that step. It's a hard step to take, but we need your help in that, Lord. And last, Lord, I know there's some here who they hear a message like this, and maybe their heart even closes off a little bit more to you or the church. I just pray for those individuals right now that they would, they would not even think about money anymore. But that ultimately they realize our heartbeat is that they would have a relationship with you first and foremost. And so I pray for those individuals right now that if they don't have that relationship, they would just say, Jesus, come into my life. Because your gift is free. And I want you to hear that, church. His gift is free. This is not about trying to receive salvation. This is not about trying to get God to love you more. It's just that he tells us in his word that when we trust him, he will do more in our lives. We get what we give out of that relationship. But the most important thing in your life is to come into that relationship. And if that's you, just say, Jesus, come into my life. Do life with me. I'm going to trust you, but I'm not there yet, so I need your help. It won't happen unless you take that first step, friends. Please do that, and Lord, I pray you would bless that because you have done everything necessary through your life, death, burial, and resurrection so that we can spend eternity with you. May that continue to be the heartbeat of our church, and may we all take advantage of that this morning. I'm going to pray this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Friends, I love you. If you need prayer for anything, there will be people up front. Otherwise, we'll see you later. Maybe I'll see you at that starting point class.